Hello, and welcome to lecture four. In this fourth lecture of the semester and the third lecture of chapter two, also the last lecture of chapter two, we're going to talk about the topic of motion with constant acceleration, which also applies to freely falling bodies, because a freely falling body, as you will see, is a constant acceleration problem. Okay? These are sections 2.7 to 2.9. Okay? Our goal here is to understand the significance of the special case that is constant acceleration and its importance for free fall problems. All right? So, very general objective there, and there you're going to see there's a lot that we're going to do with this. It's a longer lecture, more so than any previous one. You might want to break up listening into it, but it has a wealth of good examples I'm going to show you how to solve. Let's get some quick key terms out of the way. So G is just the acceleration on the surface of Earth. Okay, It is created by gravity, all right, and it creates one single acceleration for everything on Earth. All right, There's only one acceleration that is experienced, and it is equal to g. Numerically, that's 9.8, okay? It isn't limited by two sig figs, but I'll always write it as 9.8, okay? Well, free fall is just a vertical constant acceleration motion, all right? That's, it's nothing special about it, except it's very common, and motion when, um, when only acceleration on the particle or object is gravity, okay? That's just free fall. If there's any other acceleration acting on an object, then it would be not considered in free fall. Okay, and that single acceleration is g, 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, we know these are the units of acceleration. It ignores air resistance or variations in g. That's the major simplification about it. Okay, because g does vary on different parts of the Earth. It varies based on your altitude. It varies based on your um, latitude, and of course, air resistance can be very important depending on these, um, the size and shape of the object. Okay, well, the kinematic equations, what are they? Well, we know what kinematics are. Well, they're a set of equations used for solving problems with constant acceleration. That's what the kinematic equations are. Um, the name is misleading because zero acceleration and non-constant acceleration, for that matter, are also kinematic. All right? But when people say kinematic equations, they mean the set of equations that apply to constant acceleration, whether it's free fall or some other constant acceleration. They're very important equations because constant acceleration is common. Why is it common? Well, for many reasons, but a big one is because of free fall, because anytime you drop something, it's approximately accelerating at a constant acceleration. All right, so let's look at our key formulas here. So we defined the kind of the calculus definition of acceleration and velocity in the last lecture. And so there's nothing new here. We, we could have used calculus to get here, but there's a good specificity and usefulness for solving a body of problems. All right, so this first equation here is velocity, that would be final velocity, and we're saying it's a neat, equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times time. So what it's saying is that that velocity as a function of time, so the vertical axis um, and the is velocity and the horizontal axis is time, is a linear function with a y-intercept of v naught, the initial velocity. The slope is, of course, acceleration, because this is in the form of y equals mx plus b. All right. So our next equation is displacement. So it is a displacement equation for constant acceleration. And it's based on the idea that you can take the initial displacement and then add average velocity times time. That only works because acceleration is constant. This would not work for a non-constant acceleration. You can prove that to yourself in calculus and we'll hint at the idea below. Well, if we take that average velocity and define it, well, it's just one half of V naught plus V. Why is that? Because the velocity is linear, okay? So this statement is true because Velocity is a line, okay? So now let's, get, now let's get down to position in a different way, or displacement expressed for constant acceleration, but instead of, ter instead of in terms of initial position, average velocity and time, now we're expressing final position in terms of initial position, initial velocity, time, and acceleration, okay? Where does the one half come from? Why is this squared? Well, that really the calculus can answer that. Graphically, it's saying that position is a parabola. So position x versus t gives us a parabola with a y-intercept of x naught. Okay, so this is definitely the equation of a parabola. We can actually um, combine equations one and two, as I note here, algebraically. Oh, excuse me, algebraically to get this last equation. So really, these are our two foundational equations for constant acceleration. And this one is always called one of the kinematic equations. Sometimes people define as many as five kinematic equations. Remember the key term. But this one, of course, is derived from the other two. But it's useful because it gives us the final velocity in terms of the initial velocity, the acceleration, and the displacement. Notice what's missing, time. So if you're not interested in time or don't need it for your solution, then you can use equation number three. All right? So 
We've seen them graphically. We've justified them a little bit. Let's show where they come from, from the calculus definition of acceleration. Okay, so from the calculus defini definition of acceleration, which is from the previous lecture that says that the change in velocity is equal to the definite integral from zero to t of acceleration function integrated over time. Well, we see that equation one comes directly from the integration where a is a constant, where the function is just a. Why is that? Well, if we evaluate the integral, we would then use the rule of the antiderivative and a would become at, evaluated from zero to t, which of course then would just become at. And then if we just solve for v, what do we get? Equation one, right? This right here is equation one. See? Okay. Well, furthermore, the change in position, of course, is equal to the definite integral of velocity integrated over time from zero to t becomes simply the following, because we're going to replace v, not with a constant this time, but with the function that we found from our first step. Okay, and when we plug that into the integral and evaluate it, we then see, right, that we're going to, that our v0 is going to become v0 t, our at squared is going to become one half, or excuse me, our at, when done with the antiderivative, becomes one half at squared, just like in the kinematic equation. I make a big deal about this because if you've seen this in a previous physics class, like in high school, maybe you didn't see where it came from, the calculus origins of, of that famous equation. And this is, of course, equation number two. Okay, so let's move on to the types of problems we're going to be looking at and start looking at some examples. Okay, so I have five types of problems, most in any lecture up to this point. I'm just going to quickly run through them so you can think about how problems can be grouped. I think it's helpful to group problems when you think about problem solving techniques. So there's simple problems that involve using a single kinematic equation, plug and chuck. Type two are problems that involve using the kinematic equations of free fall, so, spe so specifically free fall, to solve for an unknown quantity like distance, time, and so on. So really like type one in terms of plug or chug, but the idea is that we need to use, as I say, the, um, the basic knowledge of free fall. What is, for example, the basic knowledge of free fall? One of the important ones is that vo velocity is momentarily zero at the top of, of a vertical toss, okay? because it has, to, it has to come to rest at the top of that toss because it's changing direction and coming back down. So there's a moment where it's at rest, where its vertical velocity is zero, okay? Then the third type of problem, fairly complex problems that involve using the kinematic equations of free fall, okay? For more than one object or, um, or involving sound, okay? So kind of a secondary constant motion that follows the original accelerating motion of free fall. Type four, are fairly complex problems that involve using the kinematic equations for more than one object or particle over different time periods. So having kind of an extra step. And finally, type five are complex problems that involve using the kinematic equations combined with additional conditions that require indirect algebraic techniques. So there's just something tricky about them, all right? So two of the types are all about free fall, and the other ones just have some aspect in terms of what, what you should be looking for and how to solve them. Let's look at some real simple ones. Because there are so many examples that I include in this lecture in order to cover the kind of the wide breadth of ideas that are within the topic of constant acceleration. I will be covering some of them more quickly than I've done previous examples, but I'll make sure to spend time on the ones that I think are particularly impo important. Okay, so example one, a car traveling at 30 meters per second screeches to a halt, leaving a 55 meter long skid mark. What was the car's constant acceleration while braking? Okay, so this is definitely an example. We just say, okay, which, which of the kinetic equations is going to work for us? Well, based on the knowns and unknowns that we were given, namely that we were given a initial velocity, a displacement, and a final velocity because we were told that there was a halt. So then we just need to solve for A. So when we look at this equation, there's only one unknown, thus it's the right equation to use. We're going to plug in our, all of our knowns, leaving A as our unknown, and just isolate A and solve for it, and we get negative 8.2 meters per second. The acceleration is negative because it's in the opposite direction of the initial velocity, whatever direction we define that to be, left, right, whatever maybe may be, north, south, okay? So particle two is a quite similar problem, except you're solving for something else, okay? So same, same kinematic equation, and you can see why, but in this case, your unknown is initial velocity instead of acceleration. So it's simply a matter of taking the square root and solving for that, okay? All right, and it's important when you do that, when you take the square root and solve for initial, the initial velocity, there's two possible solutions, because it's always plus or minus once you do the square root. In this case, only the positive solution makes physical sense. So we'll talk about times when the negative solution is the only one that makes physical sense. Okay, so now let's move on to our first free fall problem. Okay, so a ball, in other words, a particle, is thrown straight up by a person standing on flat ground. There's no significant drag. And the motion of the ball is entirely vertical. 
If the initial velocity of the ball is 26.25 meters per second and the initial height is 1.305 meters, what is the maximum height achieved by the ball? At what times after the toss is the ball at a particular height of 2.225 meters? How fast is the ball traveling when it hits the ground? At the feet of the person who tossed it. All right, so it's going to come all the way back down to the ground. Okay, so at maximum height, the ball is momentarily at rest with v equals zero. Okay, thus, using the equation that we've used in the previous two examples, we can say, based on this picture, right, because this is just saying that the initial velocity has to be up, gravity is down, okay, so then we can say the following. I'm going to put in the final velocity, because again, the final velocity must be zero at the very top of the toss, and part A asked about the time to get to the toss, so, um, so of course, we are interested in that, or rather the maximum height, rather, instead of the time, okay, and then we see, okay, here is our initial velocity. Notice that A becomes negative 9.8. That's not because g is inherently negative, but because of the coordinate system that we chose with positive y defined as upward. That just sets initial velocity as positive and gravity as negative. So we just have to be consistent with our signs and our chosen picture slash coordinate axis, okay? So our unknown here is y. It's, I didn't just put y in here by itself like you might, might in some problems because our initial velocity is specified, so we have to find y relative to the initial velocity, okay? All right, and we'll go ahead and do that. All right, just some algebra steps to isolate it, and we get a maximum height of 36.46 meters. Okay, in part B, we're asked about the time and position. So now we're going to use, finally, a different kinematic equation, kinematic equation 2. This is the one where you are, if you're interested in either time or position, is a good match, okay? Or perhaps you're given in time, time and position and are interested in acceleration. Whatever it may be, we evaluated our unknowns and found that this is the right one to use. All right, well, so we know everything in terms of initial position, or excuse me, initial position, final position, initial velocity. We certainly know acceleration because it's just gravity. What we don't know is t. That's our variable. Now, of course, t then shows up twice as t and t squared. How do we isolate it? How do we solve for it? Well, we use the quadratic equation. So I've done here, right? So I was very careful, careful to put negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. In doing so, I was, as, as I was about to say, I was very careful with the signs because it's important that you are. For example, in the denominator, the 2a just becomes negative 9.8 because the 2 times 1 half cancels out. And that's important too because the sign is left, so the negative in the denominator cancels with the leading negative in the numerator. And we go ahead and solve for t. There's two real solutions. There's one that is just a fraction of a second, and one is 5.322 seconds. Well, one is on the way up, and one is on the way down. Of course, the much larger one is on the way down. And the reason that it's so much larger is because this is very near the initial height. And of course, the ball goes much higher than that and has to come all the way back down. That's why there's such a large amount of time that has elapsed. So we can save time by starting at the top for part C. And part C just asks for how fast it's going when it hits the ground. So we're just going to start at the top and find out the velocity at the ground, okay? So then we plug in. We're trying to find out when it, when it gets to the ground, and we know its maximum height is 36.4, okay? And then I end up with an equation, a plus or minus square root. And in this case, the only velocity that makes physical sense is the negative one, because when it hits the ground, it must be moving in the negative y direction, okay? So then you can see this, the, or with this example, I suppose, you can see a lot of the steps that are involved in a common free fall type of problem. Okay, all right. So let's look at some other more complex free fall problems. We have two kind of types of problems here um, that are quite similar to each other. Um, they involve two objects um, then in vertical motion, and maybe they need to get to the same place at the same time. Um, in fact, um, I suppose that's true of both of them. They just, in both cases, we have two objects that need to get to the same place at the same time. In one case, one case, in example four, they're both moving downwards. In example five, one's moving down and one's moving up, okay? So you just have to kind of get used to variations on the theme here. Um, maybe the second one is more complex because of that different directionality of them and paying attention to the signs. But let's look at the commonalities and how we would solve a problem like this. Okay, so example four. At the same moment, one rock is dropped and one is thrown, okay? The one that's thrown is thrown down with an initial velocity of 41.2 meters per second, okay? And then we're asked, how much, um, how much earlier does the thrown rock strike the ground? Okay, so the, um, for, find the air time for each rock, okay? So we're going to um, take a look at rock one, all right, and find the time that it takes, that it spends in the air. 
which is 12 seconds. And then for rock two, we're gonna find the time that it spends in the air, which is 8.52 seconds, okay? So that's all I did is just find out, well, okay, well, the one that was dropped from rest spends more time in the air. The one that was thrown downwards with an initial negative velocity of 41.2 meters per second spends less time in the air, okay? And that makes conceptual sense. So it is a, then it's just a matter of finding the difference between the times. And excuse me, a second ago I misspoke. It said that these um, problems both involved objects meeting in the same place at the same time. Um, I was thinking of a different one in the notes, okay? Um, all right, so moving on. A person drops a stone off a 200 meter cliff and then one second later throws a second stone straight down off the same cliff, all right? So how fast must the person throw the second stone so that both stones arrive at the same time? So this, example five, is a more complex problem. I would say in example four, we're able to kind of separately solve for the, a variable, in this case time, for one object, separately solve for that same variable for the second object, and then just compare the two. Here, we really have to actually find a way to relate them directly. How do we do that? Well, the position function for this, functions for the stones are the following for the drop stone and this one, for the, um, for the stone that is, um, that is dropped later. So um, now here's the thing, well, it's thrown later. So let's think about this. For the drop stone, there's no V naught. So there's just an initial position and gravity, okay? For the, for the stone that's thrown later, and of course we're trying to find out how fast it was thrown, we um, do have an initial velocity and we have T minus one second. Why is that? Well, because there was a delay. It wasn't thrown until one second later. So the idea of here of replacing T with T minus one second um, might seem tricky at first, but is a crucial way for us to solve for t and then use our solution to solve for the unknown in this equation. Because the unknown in our position equation for the thrown downward stone is going to be, of course, the initial velocity. All right? So let's use the first equation for the drop stone to find t. Okay? So here we are. t is 6.38 seconds. Reality check. That time is the time it takes the drop stone off the edge of the 200 meter cliff to hit the ground. Well, that means that the one that was thrown one second later has 5.38 seconds to catch up. And that's the whole point. We need to make sure it's going just fast enough initially that it can catch up in 5.38 seconds. Okay, all right, so then it's just a matter of plugging what we got. So it has the same initial height as the dropped one. And the T is 5.38 because I've already subtracted the one from 6.38. And now it's just a matter of solving for V naught. Okay, so we're just gonna isolate V naught, and we find out that it needs an initial downward velocity of 10.7. The negative here is important, right? The negative just naturally comes out of solving for it. And why is that? Well, because I just, I left it as positive. Now, what some people might do in this problem, quick kind of side note, because I see this so often, it's not bad, but be aware of it. You might write this equation as zero equals 200 meters minus V naught times 5.38 minus one half dot, 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 right? Now, why is that? Because if you're like, oh, well, I'm obviously solving for a downward velocity. It even said here, right? It has to be thrown down, right? Well, that's then, but then doing so, if you just, if you say, oh, it's gotta be negative, so then put the negative in there. When you actually solve for the variable, you'll get a positive answer because you're solving for the magnitude, having already assumed the direction. And that's fine. You can solve the problem that way as long as you put a box around something that has a negative on it, but just be aware of what you're doing because you don't want to confuse yourself and think, oh wait, I solved for it, it's positive. Oh, I guess it must really be positive, right? Because of course it's not. You just are essentially in that case, double counting the negative. Okay, all right, let's look at a quick concept question, rather interesting one with four parts. We're given some velocity versus time graphs and we're asked in part A, which of the graphs below represent the velocity of a rocket that is moving upward at constant velocity um, when at t equals zero, the rocket's thrusters fire and propel the rocket up Rocket, rocket, excuse me, upward with constant acceleration. Constant acceleration. So it goes from some non-zero V naught, and then it starts accelerating at a constant rate. So which which of these velocity versus time graphs would would satisfy that? Well, constant acceleration means linear velocity. So it's got to be one that has a linear velocity. So I'd say like either A E or A F. Which one do you think it is? A F, of course because it's accelerating upwards, right? So its velocity is increasing linearly. Okay, B, which one of the graphs represents the velocity of a rocket that is moving upward at constant velocity when at t equals zero, the, rockets begin to, the rocket begins to freely fall under, let's just say under, the influence of gravity alone. Okay, so now it's linear, again, because it's constant acceleration, but it's going down. I guess that one's gotta be AE, right? No, well, sure enough, okay? So, which one of the graphs represent 
the velocity of a rocket that is moving upward at constant velocity when at t equals zero, it um, experiences zero net um, vertical acceleration. A win at t equals zero and continues to really and experiences zero net vertical acceleration. So it just continues at constant velocity. <coughs> Excuse me. Which one would that be? Well, it's the one that's flat. It's AB. Okay. Which one of the graphs represent a rocket that at t equals zero is at rest? Oh, okay. And then experiences a linearly decreasing non-constant acceleration that is initially positive. A lot of information there, but we can actually even kind of not even worry about this non-constant business because what's the only one that starts at rest? Right? OC, the only one, right? And but this does match the idea because initially there'd be a velocity that's positive. At some point it zeroes off and then after a while, excuse me, the acceleration becomes negative because the acceleration is the slope of the tangent line at any particular point, positive, zero, negative. Right? So that's an acceleration that itself is, well, probably linearly decreasing in order to create a parabolic velocity. Okay? All right, let's do another concept question. The graph below shows the position function for a runner that is running at constant velocity in meters per second and a bus that is slowly accelerating meters per second squared. At what approximation, approximate time does the runner pass the bus? And when does the bus pass the runner? At what point in time do the runner and the bus have the same approximate instantaneous velocity? And approximately how long could the runner delay starting and still barely just catch the bus? Okay? And in that case, they would be running at the same speed, we assume. Okay? Well, let's take a look. So the answer to A, when the runner passes the bus, is at 0.5. It's right here. Okay? We just look at the first intercept between the linear um, line for the um, runner and the curved line for the accelerating bus. And they cross first at about 0.5 seconds. All right, in part B, we're asked when the bus catches the runner, well, that's when they cross again. And that happens way over here at about 6.5, okay? So then, at what point in time do the runner and the bus have the same approximate instantaneous velocity? Well, we need them just to have the same slope of a tangent line. So basically, the tangent line of the linear velocity or position function for the runner is just the slope itself. So if I imagine taking that slope and I just need to match up, well, that's gonna happen somewhere right at about 3.8 seconds. That's where the tangent lines match up, all right? Where the tangent lines are equal. And in D, approximately how long could the runner delay starting and just barely catch the bus? Well, there we just have to draw our equal tangent lines again and just imagine extending the tangent line down and finding its intercept with the horizontal axis. That's about one and a half seconds. Because the runner waited to one and a half seconds and started running, it'd be essentially like moving this line over to over to here and having it just kiss the curve of the bus once the most efficient way, I suppose, to catch the bus. Okay, so now let's look at another um, problem that involves free fall, but in this case it involves a sound signal uh, traveling back up from the location where the object hit the ground. So if you drop a stone down a well that's 120 meters deep and the sound, and sound is assumed to travel at a speed of 340 meters per second, then how long after the moment you drop the stone do you hear the splash? So we're not worried about the mechanisms of sound. Okay, that's a topic for, um, for another class. Um, we just need to know that sound is not an accelerating uh, motion, it is a constant velocity motion. Okay, so we have a picture. All right, this is the initial position, which is positive 120. The final position at the bottom of the well we define as zero. We define positive y is up. We know that the ball, we're gonna find the time for the rock to travel down and then the time for the sound to travel back up. All right, so t fall is found simply using the position function here and going ahead and solving for t. In this case, we don't have to use the, um, the quadratic formula because the, the object has dropped, so the middle term is just zero. And so then we can just so, uh, solve t directly and we get 4.9 seconds. Well, then we just need to find out how long it takes the sound to travel up, which is just going to be distance over time, all right? And that's gonna, um, excuse me, that's gonna give us velocity. To isolate time, we're just gonna take distance over velocity. And that, of course, gives us units of seconds, and it gives us 0.35, because it doesn't take all that long for the sound to travel the 120 meters back up. We um, combine those times together, and we get 5.3, all right, once we round the two significant figures. Okay, and I'm assuming two, because you know, there's no kind of dot after the end. One more concept question, um, just to make sure we're clear on the idea of the graphs of the kinematic equations. Complete the vertical position of velocity and acceleration graphs as a function of time for a bullet that is shot straight up from the ground and lands back on the ground. Ignore drag. You should really pause the video and do this yourself, okay? If you haven't already looked at the notes and committed it to memory, okay? So let's see if you can, because this idea, this should be a fairly simple task. It's, it's, the, it's me looking for that basic level of comfortableness with the material. 
Okay, well, the, posi the position versus time graph should be a parabola because constant acceleration motion means parabolic position as a function of time. The velocity should be linear and it should start at some positive value, pass through zero, because that's where it's momentarily at rest at the top, at the top of the toss, and then it then come down to an equal magnitude negative value when it hits the ground again, right? And it's supposed to be equal. And finally, acceleration is constant, it's negative, all right? It's negative because we defined V naught as positive, and since it's constant, it's just a horizontal line, right? Notice where I put the zero, right? The zero isn't always at the intersection of the, on the axes in this case, okay? Question two, complete the vertical position, velocity, and acceleration graphs, so same thing, as function of time for a pebble that is dropped off the edge of a cliff. So instead of tossing something up, having it reach a max height and fall back down, now we're just tossing something straight down a cliff. All right? All right? So, the, oh, dropped. I actually had one where I said toss, but in this one, it's dropped. If, it, if it's dropped, then the initial velocity is what? Zero. Okay, so if we look at position, and sure, sure enough, we have half a parabola. And if we look at the tangent slope here, then we see that the initial um, velocity is zero because the initial slope has to be zero. That helps in drawing it because we know then the line has to be horizontal at the top. The velocity is linear, starting at zero, all right? And then of course the, acceler um, the acceleration is unchanged. It's just always g, okay? g in magnitude, negative depending on our coordinate system. Standard coordinate system, it's downwards, thus it's negative, okay? All right. All right, let's look at a problem that doesn't involve free fall, but involves two separate objects and comparing their motion, okay? So there's a lot of steps to this one. So I'm not gonna spend that much time in every individual step. This is a good one to review in more depth if you're interested in it, or if you wanna give it a try to solve it yourself. All right, so here's the system. We have a car that is gaining on another car. It notices, notices it's gaining on the other car, so it starts to um, decelerate, okay? Meanwhile, the second car, after a delay of one second, actually uh, notices someone's on their tail. So it says, oh, I, I should probably get out of the way and, or, or wake up and start driving faster. So they start accelerating. So we have one person that's being safe, that's decelerating because they see a car in front of them that they're gaining on. The other person in front of them decides to start driving faster, so they start accelerating. So they're both doing actions to avoid each other. One of them start at t equals zero, and the other one starts at t equals one second. Okay, so that's the setup. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of steps to that because we've got split motion in time and we've got two separate objects. How do we go about solving this? All right. Well, here are our kinematic equations, of course. Let's think about which ones we're going to use. So uh, consider the first, um, the first second of motion. So what happens in the first second of motion? Well, for car, uh, for car A, this is its change in position and this is its change in velocity. For car B, this is its change in position. It's not accelerating yet for that first second. And its change in velocity is no change at all because it's not accelerating yet. All right. So if we go ahead and numerically find out, we can find out that the first car changes 32.9 meters or moves forward 32.9 meters in the first second. Its velocity increases to 32, uh, excuse me, decreases to 32.3 meters per second in the first second because it is already accelerating. Remember, it started at 33.5. The second car um, covers a distance of 90.1 meters in the first second. All right, and that's all we need. All right, looks good, right? And it's, you can think of this as not gaining 90.1 meters, but having a final position of 90.1 .1 meters because its initial position already started at 61 since it was ahead of the car. And whereas the initial position of car A started at zero. That's why it has such a much smaller value. All right, so consider all the time after first second motion. All right, so now we're just gonna do the same sort of thing, find the position for A and B. And here you can see I'm just plugging in my values, but I'm gonna solve for T, okay? So what I do then is I set those two equations equal to each other because the only way that they're going to crash, because after all, I didn't call a lot of attention to it, but in part A, we ask, is there an accident? A simple question. Well, the only way there could be an accident is if we set these two position functions equal to each other and then solve for T and find out that there is in fact a solution. If there is a real solution, if my calculator gives me a time, that actually means, yeah, they crashed. But if you do that, if you check for a solution, you'll see there's only imaginary, thus no real solutions, thus no physically meaningful solutions, which means they do not crash, okay? In part B, we're asked how close do they even get to each other? Because now, now, now we know they don't crash, but do they get awfully close to each other, all right? So we're gonna define a new function to represent the displacement between the cars. I'll call this F, all right? It's a function of T, and it's simply the position function of B minus the position, position function of A. All right, so it's a time-dependent equation that tells me how far apart they are. 
All right, so I plug it everything from those position functions, canceling out and combining terms, so it cleans up nicely. And then I go ahead and um, find the t solution for um, the derivative of this function equal to zero and find the time of the minimum, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna set this function, its derivative equal to zero, because then I'm, it'd be that I'm essentially finding the minimum, okay? When I do that, and I solve for t, I find that their minimum moment of approach is after 1.5 seconds. Because otherwise, I, don't, I can't just find the point where they're closest to each other without knowing when they're closest to each other. So, I, so in other words, I took the velocity function between them, all right, because of course it's the derivative of a position function, and found that the point where it, that relative difference between their velocity is, is uh, going to be um, smallest, because that represents or rather not when it's smallest, but when it, that, where it intercepts the x-axis, excuse me for the confusing wording, but when it intercepts the x-axis, because of course where it intercepts the x-axis is the minimum of that position function, okay? How do I know it's a minimum and not a maximum? Well, I can graph it to check, okay? Or you could do a second derivative test. All right, so now I have that time. I'll plug it back in to just the, um, the difference function, the, different position, the difference in between their positions function, and I get 54.8. Simple as that, right? Well, so that's actually not very close because I mean, think about it. They start at 61. So they never really got all that close to each other because they were both such safe drivers with one accelerating and the other one decelerating that yeah, they responded quick enough and the crash was not only avoided but never was close to happening, okay? All right, hopefully you found that interesting. So now let's look at another one. You are driving your car at 12 meters a second when a deer jumps in front of your car. What is the shortest stopping distance for your car if your reaction time is 0.8 seconds and your car breaks at six meters per second squared? So this is a much easier problem than the previous one. Why do I classify as the same type of problem? Because there are two segments of time. There is the time before you're accelerating when you're still maintaining a constant velocity and then the time afterwards where you actually are um, have, uh, undergoing a negative acceleration, a deceleration. Right? So I'm just going to quick uh, show you the solution here. Here's the picture. Initial velocity, car. We're solving for this minimum stopping distance. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to set up this equation and solve for um, how far the car goes in, um, in the first time or the first um, um, moment, of the, which is the reaction time. So this is simply the distance the car covers in that first 0.8 seconds before the person begins to brake. All right. And then I'm going to find the time of brake. All right. It's found from this equation here. Okay, so then I find that it takes two seconds to break. And then I'm just going to um, then plug that into a position function. So the 9.6 meters covered before the braking even began. And then the distance covered during braking, during braking. Um, now that I know that braking takes a total of two seconds, and I get 21.6 meters. That's the best case scenario for this person with this particular reaction time if they're driving at this speed in order to stop. So if the deer is any closer than that, they're hitting the deer. Okay? All right. Last problem, okay? This is the one I classify as a kind of a particularly subtle approach. Now, to be fair, I probably could have uh, considered example seven to be subtle, especially considering that we had to take a derivative to find a minimum value of a function. So part B, um, I would say, was as that same level of problem. This one, however, I had already um, classified as such, and I kind of, um, it was a, a problem I already had in my mind as having a, an unusual approach to it. So let's take a look at it. A college student is running as fast as she can at a certain velocity, okay? This is her initial velocity. In order to catch a bus at the same moment that the student has achieved her maximum running velocity, the bus is 40 meters in front of her, okay? And it's starting to move from rest, okay? So she was running for the bus, hoping that it, it wouldn't start moving, seeing it in front of her. It already started moving, but instead of giving up, she's gonna keep running and she, so, she hopes she's gonna catch it. The bus moves with a constant acceleration of 0.17 because it's speeding up to speed up to its cruising speed, right? meters per second squared, the units of acceleration. If the running student experiences a negative acceleration due to fatigue, oh, okay, then what is the largest value of acceleration possible that so that she still catches the bus? So let's think about the question here. I'm not asking you how long it takes to catch the bus. I'm not asking you if she take, catches the bus. I'm asking you that, assuming that she can catch the bus, but that she's not perfect, she's not a machine, so she's gonna get winded as she runs, at, re at what rate could she lose velocity and still make it, okay? So what is her maximum fatigue acceleration, it's gonna be negative, that she can undergo and still catch the bus, okay? All right, and the fatigue acceleration begins at the same moment that the bus begins accelerating, all right? All right, so how do we solve this? So for the student to catch the bus, the two position functions must equate. 
Okay, so we have to have the position function of the bus equal to the position function of the student. It has to be some point where those two functions equate, kind of like for the if do the does the car crash question before. Well, in that case, there was no solvable answer. There was no t that made that equation true, so we could then come to the conclusion they didn't crash. In this case, we were it's different because we're assuming that she does catch it, and instead we're solving for something else. All right, so that means we're actually just going to go ahead and think about solving this problem for t. But hold on. We have two unknowns. We don't know the time it takes for them for her to catch the bus, and we don't even know the acceleration, the fatigue acceleration, because after all, we were asked for the fatigue acceleration. So how can we solve a single equation of two unknowns? Is there some other uh, equation that's gonna give us one? No. We can't use any other kinematic equation to get any more information. We're stuck with two unknowns. Hmm, interesting. But we can't solve a single equation for two unknowns. So instead, we evaluate the radicand for a single real solution. So kind of like the other problem about do they crash, we're going to evaluate one part of the problem because we know the expression inside the quadratic formula that's inside the square root, called a radicand, has to be greater than zero. Well, it turns out when we look at the, the values that are in that square root, the, the a, the acceleration, our unknown is in there. So that allows us to turn it into an equation and solve for a. Okay? So I'm just going to combine like terms from our original um, equation of sending the position function is equal to each other. So all I've done there is just combine the linear term, the, um, or the constant term, the linear term, and the, quad, uh, the quadratic term. I'm going to then use the quadratic formula to solve for t, right? Notice there is an unknown in it, so it's not solvable as is. But the radicand is the highlighted section inside the square root, okay? And as I said before, the radicand must be greater than zero for a real solution. Okay, so it sounds like we're going to set up an inequality. Oh, excuse me. But we actually don't. We set up an equality. So I just take the thing inside the square root and just set it equal to zero. Well, how can I get away with that? Well, that's because I can set it equal to zero because I want the max fatigue acceleration. All right? I'm not, I'm not asking for like any arbitrary fatigue acceleration or a range of fatigue accelerations. I just want the max. Okay? All right. Well, then set it equal to zero. That's the, that's the big as it can be. All right? And then this is a matter of isolating A. And we get 0.143 meters per second squared. Okay? Now, Notice here, I actually did, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, something a, a, a kind of alternative approach to solving these. I actually solved for the magnitude of the, of the fatigue acceleration. I, even a minute ago, I said, oh, it's going to be a negative value. And it is indeed a negative value. I probably should have put the negative in there. But the reason that I solved for its magnitude is because I assumed that it was negative. Right there, when I put that negative sign in there, I assumed that it was moving in the opposite direction as the, of the acceleration of the bus, in the opposite direction of the initial velocity of the runner. Right? I, you know, because of course it, it is. I mean, that, that's the, the, the only interpretation of the problem. But I could have just left it as positive and just solved for A and got a negative in my final answer. Okay? All right? And no, I actually won't mark you down for giving me this as long as you're clear on how you set it up. Okay? It's just a word of warning. It can be a little confusing. Yeah. But I suppose lots of things about these problems can be. Now, I left a lot of examples to solve because I just had so many other kind of potential ones I could have, I could have uh, presented in the notes. So you have lots of ones to work on if you, um, if you do want to solve any of those for credit or practice. And um, I just want to thank you so much uh, for watching this lecture video, and I really hope it was helpful.